All right, welcome back to the shop. I did some research on the Dodge Scale, <clears throat> pardon me, and found the patent drawings on this. So there were three patent drawings, two of which weren't really applicable to this particular unit. The final final patent was. Uh, the patent number is uh, 734,383, and this is invented by a man named... DJ Whelan. So uh, anyway, these patent drawings are just awesome. I'll, I'll include these in, but but just for my own my own sake and trying to articulate what I'm talking about here is, is this scale. You know, this, this looks similar to what we have. However, it's not I not identical. Uh, what the main distinction here is that this rear section here would be the adjustment for the weight on this scale. So this, I think they called it a counterpoise. And then this would have a locking mechanism here, this number 25. And then this shaft would be relatively smooth and be able to slide in and out. And that, you know, makes sense. That, that That's logical in my mind. However, this scale does not have that. And there doesn't seem to be any locking mechanism in there. So, then we move to the other side. And this side says, okay, well, it's got a, a knob on the end, and you can see through the hatching here that this is obviously threaded, so this must unscrew. Now, these ends look different, and they have completely different ends in mind, or like different purposes, if you will. So, when I look at this, these two ends are identical. So I would think that they would, for production purposes, want to utilize similar techniques and and for the life of me I can't find any reason why this shaft is not one piece and there is no possible way to get this shaft out of here without removing this end so anyway all this is to say is that this button on the end is causing me some sort of second thoughts I wonder if it's a uh, an aesthetic that's put on here to cover a, a screw or something that might be helping retain this um, I don't I think either way right or wrong if I put a little bit of heat on this it's not gonna hurt anything because this is all solid metal and a little bit of differential temperature is probably gonna help free up some stuff that's because uh, this has been on here for well over a hundred years so uh, so but again I want to be extremely careful with this stuff and uh, but I want to get it all disassembled because these pieces all need to be cleaned up properly and uh, you can see some of that just looks horrible in there so I'm going to throw a little bit of heat on the end of this and see if anything moves or if there's any indication that silver solder or, or any type of solder was used on there. And, and again, my, again, I just, I think that the threading could be here, but the, I don't know, there's just there's something, it's not matching up and I want to sort of tread lightly until I figure out what's going on here. So, anyway, let me heat this up and I'll bring it back. All right, so I'm making some progress. I got, I got one side off, and it is threaded. All right, so this is very interesting. What's in here is is a bunch of little tiny steel pellets. So you can see those, and that's the ballast to adjust this scale. So that's super neat. I'm going to have to keep this upright, or find a screw that goes in there or something to keep all those in there. And, uh, anyway, that's pretty cool. Alright, so this thing is, is fighting me every inch of the way. The, 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 the shaft here will not come out because it hits here, and it doesn't want to, doesn't seem to want to move. I had screwed the end back in and sort of tapped it on the table, trying to see if it would just, if it was a slip fit on there. And, and I'm sure it is a slip fit, but you know, it's on there pretty tight, so I'm going to bring this over to the media blaster and get it cleaned up, and that way I can sort of better assess everything that's going on here. I'm not sure where I left off on this, but but I've been unable to make any progress in moving this shaft. So I'm just going to try to be as delicate as I can with it and clean this up as one whole assembly. 
and I can see that these are separate pieces like I can see the ridge in there but it's just not moving and I've been sort of pummeling this block of wood here because I'm just putting indents on my cutting mat here but uh anyway it's just not moving I indexed it to see if I could see it moving and it just moves ever so slightly and I tried and tried and tried with heat tried to expand this ring out and anyway I uh I apologize for anybody who's trying to restore one of these on their own who wants to know how to disassemble this. I'm sure that, <laughs> that later on somebody will inform me on how to do that, but, but right now this video is going to lack that crucial piece of information. And, you know, usually the patent drawings are helpful for these things, but, you know, it just doesn't, it doesn't seem to give me any indication of how these mechanisms are. Typically they would have like a a hatch drawing of each one of these, but they don't. I'm just going to infer that this shaft is solid all the way through there, and then this should slide off, because the shaft size on this side and on this side mic out the same. So I went ahead and mic those, and then they both mic it, you know, roughly, you know. Anyway, they're both the same size. So what I'm going to do now, though, is sort of again the the tedious but you know somewhat rewarding task of polishing up these smaller pieces and I have quite a few of these uh, and uh, so I need to polish those and then also what I want to do is is get rid of the pitting that's in there and I think the best way to go about doing that is to do a little bit of body work and they have this stuff called spotting paste spotting glazing putty and I guess we can go ahead and do it right now. But these have been cleaned and wire wheeled. And uh, this is effectively like just Bondo in a tube. So I'm going to just put some of this on here and spread it out quickly. Because it drives, it, it can't be a big hole. It's got to be a shallow hole. Um, or else the, the stuff at the bottom will never dry. But anyway, I'm going to spread this out on here to try to fill these holes and then bring it over and sand that piece down and then hopefully that should, that should fill in all those holes pretty nicely so when I paint it, it's nice and smooth. Alright, so I've got that spread out on there. I'm going to let that dry for 15 or 20 minutes. Now on the end of this, I saw a little piece of metal sticking up and I started digging around and I pulled this tack out of there. So and it looks like a piece of cork that was in there so so I think that the I can pull the rest of this cork out of here and then later on when I go to rebuild this I'll I'll reinstall some some sort of stopper here because I think this is where the pad lands for the, the weighted side of the scale so probably just saw a quick time lapse of me polishing up these two pieces and you can see that the you know the before and the after are pretty good um, you know you're not getting much of a reflection in that one and then of course there you are in this one the red of the, the compound the you hear me use the word rue every once in a while it's uh they call it jeweler's rue or, or polishing compound or whatever in d degree of coarseness you know from black usually like the darker the color I thought but anyway that was wrong so you know black brown white these are from coarse to fine so what I've done is in and not this is this is not the way to do it I typically use a black rubbing compound on my like one and only uh, fiber or my uh, buffing wheel and, and then I was mixing it with the red, and, and so it's, there's sort of a, a contamination issue going on there. I'm sorry for the lights my uh, overhead lights are causing there and that glare. But anyway, what I'm going to try to do is rectify that, that contamination issue by using... Uh, by, I bought some new wheels, and I think this is going to help me sort of get a better product at the end of the day. You can see that the... I, I, I'm not 
the, the yellow wheels and the red wheels, this, this feels a little denser to me. This is a little softer. So I think my, my logic is I would use the, the black, the rougher, coarser stuff on the, the tougher wheel and then use the, this has got more flappiness going on there so it's a little softer. And then all the way down to the, the blue on the very fine, then that's sort of an all purpose. I might use this the blue. That's that's the really mirror polished stuff. So, but right now I'm not gonna I'm not gonna try I'm not gonna upset the apple cart by tr trying anything too new at this point because I'm happy with the product that I'm getting at this stage. If I go back later on, I reserve the right to do that. But uh, but nevertheless, I'm gonna come through and, and I'm using the fiber wheel to knock off the the heavy patina on here, and then I'm moving right onto that contaminated wheel with the red roux and. Um, but anyway, I'm just going to keep doing these and uh, skip that time lapse of that part because you've already seen one, a couple of these done. So. All right, so this is the nut for the the lead screw. Oops. And it has this little detent here, it's sort of a relief that this spins over and engages at some point. And I imagine this is some sort of a backlash for this nut. And then, you know, in addition to, to sort of mitigating any backlash that's in here, there's also this sort of pinch nut. And then there's a flathead screw there that it looks like it might even... So there's a screw in the back. Ah! screw in the back and then this little pin that go right there so oops, sorry so that through hole there takes this little pin and this this little screw, uh, spring there alright so that's all the pieces cleaned up I've still got a little bit more work to do on this as I mentioned in the first video uh, I got some some great remarks about what I can try to clean this out with and whatnot and I think I think at the end of the day that there's I might need to dust this with the media blaster because there's some schmoo in there. Um, but but I did get some interesting comments. I've got some flour and salt and things like that that I might try on this, and uh, and, and we'll see. Uh, these pieces cleaned up well, and and I'm hopeful that I will be able to utilize the old bolts. The old bolts in this thing, of course, look like this. But I, but I took it to the wire wheel, and then the fiber wheel, and then the buffer, and was able to, to clean those up pretty good. So that, I think, is salvageable. And going down and nickel and dime in these flathead bolts is going to be, you know, can be pretty expensive. I did order a bunch of brass bolts that are flathead, so period crack stuff, uh, or not flathead, this uh, tapered head, if you can see that some really small stuff uh, I don't I don't want the next person out to, to fiddle with these little steel screws so I bought brass hopefully those uh, will not get stuck in here and God knows how many hundreds of years it'll be if ever if somebody ever goes through this again but anyway it's cleaned up pretty good but but my one problem or one issue that I have right now is that even with the narrow fiber wheel I'm unable to really get in here and clean the inside of this out nobody will ever see this but I will know, and I'm not willing to let that go. So, what I'm going to do here is sort of go off and uh, clean this off camera with this pencil tool. And it's going to be slow and sort of arduous, but the reason I'm going to do that is because I'm actually going to parlay off of this and turn this into a separate video because I had several people ask me over the last, you know, it's probably been 12 hours since I passed it, uh, or less than 24 hours since I posted the last video about this pencil grinder. They're very interested in it for a number of reasons. One is, you know, it's a lot cheaper than a Dremel tool. And two, you know, it doesn't use much air. Look at this little tiny line. This thing can just purr along if you have a small small air compressor. It, it Relatively speaking, it's an air hog because it's just uncontrolled flow all the time. However, it uses, you know, a relatively small amount of air. I can use this thing for 15 minutes before it trips off my air compressor um, depending on the setting but anyway I'm going to go watch another video it'll be called pencil grinder or something or other and will be posted very closely to the time that this video is posted and uh, 
Anyway, let me go ahead and do that and try to get this out there because a lot of people were interested in it. So, before I start mixing up batches of all sorts of weird concoctions, I'm going to try what's been a relatively useful staple. I haven't used it a long time ago, but, but many moons ago I used to work in a machine shop. And when we would have something metal that was very dirty, oven cleaner was the go-to. It was relatively expensive compared to the rest of the stuff we had there. We had hot tanks and engine block cleaners and all this other stuff and, and that usually did a pretty good job but but every once in a while we'd have something that was just so bad that carburetor cleaner brake cleaner all that stuff just really wouldn't touch it so we'd use some oven cleaner and you know for five dollars and fifty cents i think that might be able to get in there and get some of this schmoo out if not then we'll we'll start going with the other recommendations but let me try this and i'll bring you back and I'll let you know how it worked yeah, i just sprayed it down we'll let that sit on there and work for a little while see that this is that glazing putty the spotting putty so all the little rust pits and dents and everything that were in there are now filled with that fiberglass or whatever that material is all right so the, the workbench is particularly me messy right now I've got a bunch of different things going on and I sort of need to get things under control again. Uh, some of its tools, some of its parts. And the, the reason that it's particularly chaotic now is that I'm testing out different processes and procedures and whatnot for sort of moving forward on this project. Because there's so many different pieces, I have done, like I'm much further ahead on some pieces than I am on others. And that's because I was, you know, this was one coat of paint stripper and and then media blast. And then this was, you know, several coats of different types of paint that strippers and, and it hasn't been media blasted or wire wheeled or anything like that. Um, the base, the base has actually had two coats of paint on it that I could tell it was silver. But the most recent version, since our family has owned it as far as I know, it was silver, but be, be, before that it was gold. And I, I'm i not sure how the gold and the brass would look together. And, and I'm still on the fence on how, how to paint this. The black, I like the black look. This is the, the finished piece. This is probably, you know, uh, again, sort of an experiment. 357 Magdad had written me and he says, you know, maybe you should paint the back of this. And I think that was a good idea. So that's media blasted. We're gonna take it outside and paint it now. All right. So this scale has a lot of different bits and pieces to it, and I can't possibly show you everything that's in it, and because or else this video would be, you know, real time, <laughs> and and nobody wants to see me work in real time because I'm really slow. 
But, so, I just disconnected the upper portion of this from here. You know, just, the, just a second ago. And, and, of course, it was a big flathead, and in order to do that, I used a, a big flathead on this little uh, Astro Pneumatic Impact. The impacts with the flatheads, they just, they have that jarring force that enable you to, to undo stuff that you just can't do by hand. And what came pouring out of this thing are these scrap nuts and bolts. There's a piece of lead in here, and, and just all sorts of square, I guess they were trying to make weight, which is really, really interesting. So I'm going to, you know, I've got the shot from the handle. I didn't show you that. I don't, I don't know if I showed you that yet. But this will drive me nuts trying to reassemble it with all these little pieces. So I'm going to keep the ballast in a separate container. Here's my mascot getting some sun today. He's a little bit bigger than the hut. Oh, there he goes. Proof that he's not fake. Alright, so here's the marble from the Dodge Scale. Been real happy with the project so far. Um, I'm not sure I'm going to edit this, but, but anyway, it's going to be a pretty scale when it's done. At least I'm hoping so. But the, one of the centerpieces is this marble that everything sets on. All the works set right on this thing. And the rust is really dug in here. So because this is a, a pervious surface, I'm not exactly sure how clean this is going to be. But I've got some, some good comments so far. And uh, somebody said the CLR. I apologize, you know, I do appreciate the comments, but the, the channel's getting more popular, and, and I read so many comments, and, 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 you know, I've sort of had a backlog of things that I'm trying to catch up on. Anyway, it's been been hectic, but um, but anyway, uh, thank you for whoever's, well, I'm not even sure this will work yet, but again, I appreciate the recommendations. I'll try the CLR, and then this is a magic eraser. I've heard this has been pretty good stuff, so... Uh, I'm going to switch cameras and start scrubbing on this thing and see what it looks like. So the CLR and the Magic Eraser and all that light duty stuff is not nearly enough. And I tried doing some hand work and I was real slow going, so I'm going to try the, the DA, the dual action sander. Let's see if that can get down through some of the staining. So one of the issues I had was they, they had some sort of a, I don't know, rubberish, butyl style material that was in this these feet that holds the, the actual scoop part. And I bought some Delrin rod thinking that I was going to machine those down on the lathe, but then I remembered I had some rubber grommets for electrical connections and you just poke a hole through it and it's like a flanged grommet to keep wires from getting cut. And those, those fit in here quite nicely. and. Uh, and that's going to save me some some time, and I think it's probably going to be just about perfect to hold those um, the scale. I think the repercussions of changing the, of using that old material versus this is that this, these might be slightly lighter than what was in there. So eventually, when I get to the point of, of tuning the scale or balancing it, um, this will account for some of that change, uh, the the lightness in these materials. But anyway, I think it's going to work nicely. So, all right, so. It's starting to come together a little bit now. I've got some very small work that comes in here. There's a, a preset, a preload spring that, if you remember, I, there's a spring that drops in here. And then this centering pin. And then there's this. And that sort of absorbs the preload as you turn. And this, this is pinned in here with a screw. That, this, this is like a locking collar, but this actually stays static. So. So I'm going to want to grease that, or at least put some light oil on it. Alright, so I'm going to 
get a better shot for you here in a minute. But right now what I'm trying to do is calibrate the scale. And I'm sure there's better ways to do this, but what I've got is this little, uh, <laughs> for lack of a better term, dope dealer size scale. Uh, anyway, I, I don't remember exactly why I had an occasion to buy this little, little thing. But anyway, um, I've got a scale. This is pretty accurate. So what I've done is I've weighed this box of trisodium phosphate, just some, some weight. And, and this thing weighs just right at 20 ounces, 20.2 uh, ounces. So the the point two, you know, that's two tenths of an ounce. I don't think is you know the accuracy with this. This is a very accurate scale. However, the resolution on the dial really doesn't account for that. Um, so anyway, I'm not too worried about it. But what I've done is I've dialed it in here at at 20 ounces, which is of course 16 ounces per pound. So it's just uh, four ounces past. If you can see, if you can see the mark here. I've got. The uh, one, two, three, four. So, like, get to a pound. Four, that's 20 ounces. So I've got it to 20 ounces, and then I started adding fishing weights until it started balancing out right. And right now it's just about neutrally balanced. It's probably hard to see that, but it, but it is sort of wavering back and forth. And this thing actually blows back and forth at the wind. It's uh, sitting on those little V guides with the glass uh, guides, I guess. But anyway. So I just added some fishing weights to this, to this, and, and right now, as best I could tell, if I add these three, three weights to the innards here, that will calibrate this scale. And if you remember what I had before, there's already a piece of lead in here. Hopefully these fit. Um, it looks like they might just fit. But what they had done is they'd used some shot, some steel shot for the handle and then threw in just a bunch of screws. And those were starting to rust and of course the rust is going to, you know, hold water and change. Not, not significantly, but, but you know, it's going to, it's just not a good idea. So I'm going to use lead because it's sort of inert and it's not going to rust. And that should calibrate the scale out and not have any capacity to, to oxidize and rust and leak down and stain the marble any more than it already is. Um, the, the scale can be oriented, as the pictures I was seeing online, can be oriented a couple different ways. Um, it can be oriented sideways like this, but then it sort of in inhibits your ability to read the scale. So um, I'm going to keep it like this for now. And I'm not going to go ahead and, and, and bother to add the shot back to the handle because I don't see the, the necessity in doing that. It sort of just adds another variable that this doesn't doesn't stand to reason why they would do that. Uh, the last thing that I have to do, and, and probably most importantly, is to fix this this vial. So let me let me get the workbench situated, and then we'll figure out how we're going to attack this. All right. So I'm not sure where I left off, but I forgot to hit the record button again. Um, long story short, is I bought some vials, bubble level vials like this, and one of them fits, but it's too short and looks awkward. The one of the viewers had commented by a bubble level, and the bubble level is a great idea. However, it's just uh, it's the outside diameter is too large. So what I've done is I bought a glass straw, a box of glass straws actually, and that fits in there pretty nice. So what I'm going to try to do is cut this glass, and then cork it off, and I'll probably fill it with mineral spirits or. Uh, Maybe isopropyl alcohol or something like that. I guess isopropyl alcohol would make more sense since it would be it would flash off quickly and, and be harmless if it spilled on anybody, as opposed to mineral spirits or whatever. I am getting tired of forgetting of hitting the record button. <laughs> anyway, I managed to get it on my first shot. What I had done is I sort of eyeballed the length. Hopefully, this is the right length, um, and I just scored it just the top. I didn't score the whole thing. Um, as much as I could and then just sort of snapped it and it, it came loose so I'm really surprised I'm happy with that so if it's the right length I should be able to get the cap on look at that so that's in there now let me figure out how to cork the ends of this off Alright, this is called the right stuff. It is it is expensive, 
but it is extremely good stuff for gasket material. It's, you know, just, just out way better than any other Permatex I've ever used, so. Let me see if I can't. All right, so that's not pretty, but it should make a good gasket material. So I'll let that tack, tack up for a little bit, then I'll fill it up and cork off the other side. I don't have any isopropyl alcohol. I'm going to try to use uh, hydrogen peroxide. All right, so there's a little bubble of them. And I was a little worried about that bubble size, but I think that's pretty good. So that is the Dodge Micrometer Pharmacy Scale, or Kitchen Scale, or whatever you want to call it. The, the only changes that I really made to this whole thing is that I added some aftermarket, aftermarket, some modern day stainless steel screws. This has some, and typically older machines have flathead screws in them. And I would have liked to have flathead, but all I had was Phillips. But I think I was willing to make the compromise here to go to the Phillips ones because they're stainless. It's just a superior product, and I'm not going to have any problems with them rusting or tarnishing or anything like that. Um, all in all, the, the color scheme, I'm relatively happy with it. I think the black accents with the here and then the, the, the this section here, I think that looks pretty nice. And it's not overboard. The uh, You can see it, it operates really nicely. It just... You know, it really, really is balanced out nice. Um, but it, but it's a, a fun was a fun restoration, and I was maybe a little disappointed in the sense that I wasn't able to get more of the the rust out of the marble. But you know, just just part and parcel of the whole the antique restoration gig. So um, I'm happy with the way it's calibrated. I think it's gonna gonna function just fine for another hundred some odd years. Um, again, the patent date on this is 1903. That doesn't give me any indication of when this was manufactured. But, uh, but anyway, I'm, I'm pretty confident that it's well over 100 years old. So, uh, very well built. Uh, by and large, there was some hokiness with just the, the way they cobbled stuff together. And I'm not sure if that was from the factory or not. Uh, I did notice that some of the screw types at the bottom, some of them were um, the cap head style bolts. Some of them were like the... Uh, the flush mount style bolts. Anyway, just sort of a hodgepodge of things. That, I mean, they didn't have a screw in there, but they had bolts with that style head mixed in with this this cap style. I don't know if you can see that or not, but um, but anyway, that was sort of an indicator with those two different style heads that somebody may have been into this thing before, or you know, times were so lean back then that they just had to use whatever they could get a hold of, uh, which is a, which is a real possibility. But anyway, the uh, the paint that I used on here is the Rust-Oleum dark charcoal gray. Uh, I like that industrial look. The, the the thought of coming through and embellishing this with some gold. Um, I have really nice gold uh, paint pens. I thought about it, but I but I think it might be a little too busy if I went back and, and did that. I think that the the brass and the black and the gray and the you know the little the stainless steel. I think that looks pretty good. But um, anything else would have sort of been overkill, I think. But I don't have an eye for that kind of stuff, so <laughs> so anyway, that's what it is. But um, I'm going to just sort of take some pictures and pan around this and, and get a little bit of better view of the bubble level and all that stuff. Um, and just put some music in the background. So uh, anyway, that'll conclude the narrative section of this. So thanks for watching. Thank you for subscribing. And, and again, thank you. Thanks just to everybody for all the comments and and support and all that other stuff. I really do appreciate it. Um, I, I think uh, right now, well, before I end, I've got it covered in this bow shield. Somebody had mentioned, uh, again, I apologize, there's just so many names. Uh, Never Dull. I've got a can of that coming in uh, in a day or two, and I think I'll, before I give this back to my father, I'm going to wipe it down with the Never Dull, and hopefully that'll keep this thing looking nice for quite a while. And, uh, Anyway, so so with that, I'm just going to leave you, and we'll get some close-ups. Thanks again.